My wife, Mary, and I would like to welcome you to Victory Lane. Thank you for choosing to worship with us today. It's our intention to provide a place of worship where people can build healthy spiritual lives for the Lord. We wish to do this by connecting people through a moving worship experience, building relationships with others, but most of all, making a connection with Jesus Christ and developing a personal relationship with him.
I so appreciate our worship team. Okay. This morning and next week, we're going to be talking about relationships. Um, this morning, we're going to be talking about the immediate family relationships. And next week, we're going to be talking about a totally different relationship. Uh, so you'll have to come back next week for that one, because that one's going to be a whole lot different than today's. Um, there is a uh, children's church, so those children that are We're going to start off by talking about the marriage relationship. Now, I want you to know Pastor Jeremiah is doing a whole series on love, marriage, and sex. The whole gamut from God's Word. I could do that, but I don't think you'll last here very long. You won't stay that long. (laughs) So, Uh, I'm just going to give you bits and pieces, but I'm going to give you a lot of scripture that you can use. How many of us at one time have said that nobody ever gave us books on marriage, nobody ever gave us books on raising children? How many of us have ever said that? I know we have, many times. Well, guess what? God did give us a book that talks about all of that. We just don't bring it to mind when we think about it. God gave us a guideline for our marriages and for grazing our children. The sad part is a lot of people don't use it. They don't use God's guideline. And sometimes that's why they wind up in trouble. How many has actually read the book of Matthew, the covering of what marriage is supposed to be according to God's guidelines? How many has ever read it? Oh my. Read it. Good stuff. We're going to touch on some of it this morning. People get married for a whole assortment of different reasons. Love, security, children, fear, loneliness. And the list could go on and on. We get married for different reasons. Some of us may have had examples, great examples of marriages as we came up in life. Others maybe not so good. And maybe some came up with disastrous ones. Either way, God gave us a great road map to a strong, successful marriage. And either we follow it or we don't. That's our choice to make. Amen? Amen. This wasn't planned. And my wife's going to kill me, but I'd like her to join me up here for a minute. right into that. This is the love of my life. But I'm going to tell you something. What noise? When I met this lady, she was 14 years old. I was 17. When she was 15, I asked her to marry me. A month after she turned 16, we were married. I raised her just the way I wanted her. I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. But 
But I will tell you this. I think I was one of the worst husbands that could have been. And the reason being is because, even though I never said it, she's the one that got married, I didn't. Because even at 16, she was more of a woman than most women I knew then. Believe it or not, she was. I was still a kid. I was 18. I, I was just turning 19. And I proved it. I had two friends that I hung out with all the time. One of them was a working buddy. The other one was a, uh, a guy I grew up with from the time I was young. And I hung out with both of them. I would go to the bars. I'd play pool. I'd go to the bars with the other one, just hang out around the bar. I never was a big drinker. If I had a drink, it was maybe, I'd have maybe a drink and it might last me halfway through the night. I never was a big drinker, but I just loved to be away. I loved to get out. And she was home all by herself, taking care of the household. And during the raising of our children, she was the one that raised the children. I was still a kid. I was still out there doing my thing. We should have been in divorce court, no fault of mine, at least, at least three times that I know of because of who I was and the way I was. But this month, we celebrated 52 years of marriage. And I thank you dearly. <laughs> so it can be done. And as far as God's word says, a marriage should last forever. And a marriage will last forever as long as you use his guideline. I wasn't even saved until I was in my mid-30s. I had no idea what this book said. Her parents, she didn't have a good raised life. Both of them were alcoholics. My parents were great parents. They, were, they weren't alcoholics. But I don't think they had a great love relationship. I think they just stayed together. Makes a big difference. Um, but I'm so thankful that she was the grown-up one. So whichever one of your halves are the grown-up ones, listen to them, okay? <laughs> listen to them. Right on. I remember reading about a lady, and, and she pretty much was close to what I could relate to. And so I, I, I copied down her story here. This lady had a real experience in the very beginning of her marriage. She began by saying that after a desperate need to belong somewhere and to someone, a few months after she had turned 21, she married her high school sweetheart, still in college, reeling from her parents' nasty divorce. She was clueless about life, relationships, and what it took to sustain a marriage. She went on to say that she didn't know who she was as a person, much less how to be a good spouse. She says, I jumped in headfirst, blindfolded, and totally naive in love with the idea of being in love, with butterflies leaping in my stomach. Basically, I expected my marriage to remain in the honeymoon state. 
My honeymoon phase lasted as long as my honeymoon. Exactly three days. When my husband and I returned from our short getaway and settled into our apartment for our first night as a married couple, we were prepared. We had the required wedding rings on our fingers, a store's worth of candles lit around the bedroom, and a silk nightgown and a king-size bed. A guaranteed ever-after night, right? Nope. Not so much. Sometime between lighting the candles and donning the nightgown, I got the flu. Double over the porcelain bowl, gut-wrenching flu. Q. My husband sweeping in to save me, rubbing my back, holding my hair, whispering how sorry he was. Instead, my brand new husband abandoned me on the cold tile floor while he fell asleep, sprawled across our bed with my cat, killing every single expectation I ever had how marriage worked. I had even left the bathroom door open so I would be easy to rescue. I mean, what was the problem? Wasn't it his job to take care of me, be my champion, my knight? Hadn't he signed up to meet all my needs the day he signed their certificate? Sound familiar? Due to my backward way of thinking, wondering what he could do for me, and not the other way around, the first 15 years of our marriage can be summed up in one word, rough. Not because he was an uncaring jerk, but because I didn't know how to be a good spouse. I was selfish, demanding, ill-equipped, and brimming with unreasonable expectations, and I guess that was me too. It wasn't until I was ready to abandon all that and ask myself how I could save my spouse, serve my spouse, that anything changed. Rather you have had a rough start or a smooth run, God cares about the state of your heart and the state of your marriage. He really does. He really does. He is an amazing redeemer who's going to ask you to change if you want your marriage to change. You have to be willing to change if you want your marriage or anything else to change, for that matter. This lady says, 25 years, three kids, two major illnesses, a cross-country move, and a lot of learning. Later, this is what I have learned about being a good spouse. And I'm going to go through some of these. Number one, get real with your expectations. This world tells us we deserve to be happy. But only God can bring us real joy. When I accept my spouse as being human and don't try to put him or her in God's place, a funny thing happens in my marriage. I begin to shift my thoughts off myself and on to my spouse. When I put my spouse's needs above my own, it changes the way we interact in a positive direction. Offer yourself as a safe 
haven. Life is hard. Jobs, kids, health, money, impossible relationships, and people. Hard choices. The bumps in the road you never saw coming. There's enough negative out there that we need a place where we feel safe and loved and wanted and important and respected. My role as a spouse is not to criticize, it's to uplift and support and encourage. I should want to be a refuge in my spouse's life so he or she sees me and our home as a safe haven. See, we have to be each other's strength because God knows what he's doing when he puts a couple together. One of the couple has strengths in one area and the other part of the couple has strengths in another area. And you have to do what you can to work those together. Okay? And if you have selfishness on either side, you've got a problem. Believe me, you've got a problem because I was very selfish, and it didn't work. Next, we need to learn to be a soul mate. You know what that means, to be a soul mate? It means you intertwine, okay? You, you, you get real with each other. You, you learn about each other. And that don't come easy. That, that, that comes with work. A willingness to communicate and not dominate. Domination is a big issue. When one of the parties says it's going to be my way or no way. Now, they may not come right out and say that, but you can see it. My way or the highway. That's not good. That's not good. It's about communication. Makes all the difference in the depth of your connection. If I'm quiet and thoughtful, if I pay attention... Watch my spouse in different situations. Take the time to learn his or her moods, to listen, to care about what's important to him or her. I'll create a soul deep bond between us that takes our medicine, marriage to a different level. Next. We need to learn to love no matter what. Falling in love is easy. How I many can say yes to that? Falling in love is easy. It really is. Oh, I like I like that. Yeah, I like that. Spend a few dates. Get, falling in love is easy. How about staying in love? That's where the rubber meets the road. Staying in love. Look at our marriages today. Look where we're at in our marriages today. It's even gotten into our churches. And it's because, it's because we didn't have a guide. We didn't use the guide that God gave us. Can God help us in those situations? If we blow it, if we mess up, if we mess up, can God help us? Can God bring us back? Yes, he can. Yes, he can. And he will. No matter how bad it gets or how bad it has gotten, God can always put it back together. Amen. But we've got to be willing to let him 
put it back together. And I'll go as far as to say, it may not be getting back together with the one that you've separated from. It may not be that one. But he can still put it back together with the right one. Staying in love takes work, and a lot of it. It's a decision. The day, day we pledge ourselves together, God expects us to choose to love each other forever. Over the years, there will be moments, hours, days, where our spouse drops to the bottom of our happy list. Times when we don't like each other very much, where we even question keeping those rings on our fingers. And it does get that bad. It does get that bad. Things can get so bad in our lives that we don't care. But if you have a good spouse, if you have someone that really cares, and you care for them, they care for you, it's worth the fight, no matter what. It's worth the fight. Amen? Where we even, uh, and those feelings are okay. You don't have to like someone to love them. Real love isn't about the butterflies kicking around in the stomach of your spouse. Real love sticks deep, lodged tight in a place not easily shaken. When you constantly show your spouse that your love isn't driven by your ever-changing feelings, but by the pact that you made to him or her, they will trust that you are in this for the long haul. Make good history together. It doesn't matter when you, meet, when you met your spouse, early, late, somewhere in the middle. The moment you commit to each other, you step out of your own story and start a new one together. Every situation we come across has the potential to strengthen or weaken. Who are we as a couple? Work hard to lay down a foundation between the two of you. Make positive pictures in the journey of your life together. There's some pretty good scriptures in God's Word. If you have God's Word, would you open up to the book of Ephesians? Rather, it's by phone or iPad or book. We're going to talk about the sideline. Ephesians 5. This passage, verse 21, this passage is for both. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. Submitting to one another. It's not one-sided in the fear of God. Men, this is for you. Ephesians 5, 25, 31, and 33. 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That's love. 31 says, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Verse 33, Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, 
and let the wife see that she respects her husband. These are some great guidelines, my friends. These are guidelines that will help you. If the husband loves his wife as Christ loved the church, how's he going to treat his wife? How does Christ treat the church? Amen? Ephesians 5, 22 to 24. For the woman, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife. You know what, men? I, I got to tell you, you love that verse, don't you? The husband is the head of his wife. But read the rest of it. As also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Verse 24. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their husbands in everything. Now, that may put you up here somewhere, husbands. But do you remember the first passages we read? Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. If you love your wife just as Christ loved the church, guess what? Your wife is probably going to be glad to submit to you. Wouldn't you think so? I think so. It worked for us. It worked for Margaret and I. We love each other equally. I tease her every once in a while and I'll say, don't forget, says I'm the Lord of the household. She says, don't forget, you've got to love me like Christ loved the church. I'm kidding. But we do. We, we understand that. We understand God's word. And we understand the love we have for each other. And um, believe me, it took a long time to get there on my part. A long time to get there. But it is so good. <laughs> All right, I'm done. <laughs> it is so good. It can be so good. Build your love with each other. Build it with each other. Let me tell you about love. How many has read the, the love chapter, what's called the love chapter in 1 Corinthians 13? I'm going to read a little bit of it here. And, and, and this kind of love, I realize he's talking about love for everyone. But you know what? For today... I like it for couples. I like it for couples. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 7. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Is not puffed up like some of us can be does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. That's for couples. 
parents' responsibility to their children. Our society today undermines and attacks the right of parents to train and supervise their own children. Entertainment, government agencies, peers, and schools all lead children to think they can do their own thing. Yet when the children do wrong, these same groups immediately blame the parents. You notice that? You notice that? It's always the parents' fault. It's a shame, but the parents of today are encouraged to leave the training of their children to others and are told that they may kill unwanted children before they're even born. As a result, children are often neglected, abused, and abandoned. We live in an ugly world out there today, folks. You read it all the time. How many times, I I don't know, in the past couple of weeks, where I've heard of mothers that have left their children in garbage dumpsters in, in, in areas, just, just, just left them like, like they were garbage. Our society has gone berserk. Parents should love their children. In Titus 2.4, says women should be taught to love their children and their Husbands, train them young. Train them young. You know, people are strange. Our two children were raised in church from the time they were, I don't know, how old were they when? I don't know, seven, six or seven years old. And yes, when children get to the age of 17 or 18, Well, actually, when children get to the age of 14, all of a sudden, the parents are the most stupid people on earth. You ever notice that? We're we're not connected. We're we're, we're, we're old-fashioned. We don't don't know what's going on. It's a whole different world out there. And you know what? In some cases, maybe it is. But... We train up our children in the way they should go, and the Word tells us to do that. The choices they make when they get to a certain age sometimes breaks our hearts, really breaks our hearts, because they seem to, no matter what they were taught, seem to just go off and try their wings. My, my children did that. They, they went off and they tried their wings, and they floated away here and there. But I thank God that they came back. They came back. And that's the one thing that God is good at. He said his word will not go void. And they won't. It won't. Some, a lot come back, a lot don't. But you know what? You continually pray for your children. You pray for them. And keep them in God's hands at all times. Parents are to reward and discipline the children as they are coming up. Hear me. I came up in this lifestyle. Spankings don't hurt. We are taught as parents today that spankings are abusive. They are not abusive. I grew up in that era. I had an awful lot of friends that grew up in that era. You know what spankings did for me? Almost my whole time growing up, if I came in contact with an adult, it wasn't, hey Dave, how you doing brother? You know what it was? Mr. McFarland, how are you today? Mrs. McFarland, how are you today? Kids today don't even know what that means. That's what spankings did for me. It taught me. They taught me. Now, I'm not talking about abuse. 
God talks about spanking, using the rod and spoiling the child. He talks about it. It doesn't hurt the children. It doesn't. You don't do it abusively. You do it like a loving parent should. I can say that because God's Word says that. Okay? Me and most of the children I grew up with did the same thing. It was... We were all very, very polite to everyone. Society encourages children today to disregard their parents, teaching and make their own choices. Young people of today often think their parents are unreasonable or do not understand. And that's what we were just talking about. Proverbs 6, 20 and 23 Listen to the instruction of parents. Do not forsake it. Listen to the instruction of parents. As long as it's good, godly advice and from God's word, it'll work. Children should respect their parents. Young people today mock, ridicule, flaunt their parents, and believe it or not, a lot of this begins at the age of 12. I have heard... 11-year-old kids using the F word like it was nothing to their own parents. That is a shame. That turns my stomach when I hear that. And you know what? The parents are no different. They're doing it with their children. It, it's a whole family issue. It's a whole family thing. What is wrong with this generation? What is wrong with our kids? We got away from this. Got away from this. Parents have God given authority and have generally done much good for their children with that authority. Ephesians 6 2 and 3 says, Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on this earth. Children should obey their parents, Luke 2.51. Then he went down to Nazareth, this is Jesus, with them and was obedient to them. Romans 1.32. Slanders, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful, they invent ways to be evil. They disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they don't only continue to do these things, but they approve of those also that do. That's just a touch. If we use God's guideline in relationships, in our relationships, if we're having hard times, get into God's word. Do it his way. If you do it his way, it'll overcome your way. And overcoming your way by God's way, right where you want to be. Amen? Next week, <clears throat> I'm going to be talking about a different type of relationship. Please be here because next week's relationship is going to be very, 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 very personal. Okay? It's a different relationship. A whole different relationship. Lord, I thank you for this day. Father, I thank you for the time that we can get together, Lord. And Father, learn about your word, Lord. Father, our families need strengthened today, Lord. There is so much of this world coming against us, Lord, and against marriages, against children, against everything that you have put out there for the family to do, Lord, and for the family to be, Lord. 
Father, there's so much coming against us today, Lord, that it's hurting us. It's killing us, Lord. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would touch each and every one of us here today, Lord, and that we would start a new direction in our relationship with each other. Lord, that we would build on your word as our relationship goes forward. Father, I pray for your strength to each one that's married out here today, Lord. And Father, they would, they would start anew. Father, if they're having situations in their marriage, if they're having problems in their marriage, Lord, Father, I pray for them. I, I pray that you would intervene. Lord, that you would touch them and strengthen them and point them in a different direction, Lord. We give you praise, glory, and honor in Christ's precious holy name. Amen. Thank you for coming. Look forward to being here next week.